Welcome to part 4 of creating visual movie effects in Blender. In this video I'll be showing you how to do corner pinning, which in Blender is actually called plane tracking, which is an effect where you can replace a image or movie on a moving a rectangular surface like a screen or a billboard or something like that. For this video I'll be working with some footage that I just shot uh, handheld with my cell phone uh, of my laptop sitting open on my coffee table. So here's this footage, and it's quite raw, it's handheld so it's shaky. Um, and I'm going to want to replace the screen image that's on my screen with something else. Uh, as you can see, this footage is pretty rough. It goes in and out of focus. It, the exposure goes up and down. Um, and so it's, it's pretty raw, but it should work pretty well. Let's go ahead and close that video and open Blender up uh, again. The first thing we have to do is actually change that video into a sequence of JPEGs. Blender does not work well uh, with video files. It works much better and you get better tracking results. Uh, and just working in general videos is better if you convert it into a sequence of JPEGs or images ahead of time. So let's go ahead and do that. I'll click on my splash screen to get rid of it. And I'll change this window type into a video sequence editor. This is a quick process. I'll change this window type into a split view so I have both the sequencer uh, with this button down here and the video window. And I'll add a movie. It's on my desktop and it is um, this source video right here. You'll actually see the result. I'm going to put this snowman animation that I made a long time ago uh, on my laptop screen. And so I'll select my source video, um, add movie clip strip. So it's adding uh, two strips, an audio and a video strip uh, to the sequencer. And of course I can scroll down and up to zoom in and out. I don't want the audio. I'm not going to care about that in this video. So I'll right click to select it and press X to delete it. Um, my timeline by default is only 250 frames long, but this video file is longer, so I'll go to the end of it and use my arrow keys uh, to figure out that it is 414, that's the last frame, frames long. I'll change my end value to 414 and press enter. Now I'm going to export this video as a sequence of numbered uh, image files. I want to make sure my resolution is correct. The video is shot in 1080p, uh, which means 1920 by 1080, but I've got to change my scale up from 50%, which is Blender's default for some reason, up to 100% just by clicking and dragging in there. Okay, I'm going to save as a sequence not of PNGs, which technically would be a better quality, uh, but we're just working with an MPEG-4 cell phone video. so. Um, JPEGs will be just fine at 90%. Uh, this is in the output section under the camera tab of the properties window. And I have to change my output location, so I'll click on this little folder, not in the temp folder. Uh, that's not where I want to save. And as you can see, I already have some old things here, but whatever, I'll just go to my desktop. And this little button up here with the folder in the start, that makes a new folder wherever you are. So I'm on my desktop. I'll click that new folder and name it a MacBook Air. Uh, corner pinning and I'll go into that folder uh, this second bar uh, right below where you're saving to is where, normally where you put your uh, file name but in this case we're gonna name our files sequentially uh, with a frame number so 0001 for frame 1 002 for frame 2 etc so we're gonna leave that blank you could put something in here and then it would number after that um, but we're not gonna bother so I'll click accept and let's go ahead and I'll speed up the video here, but I'll click on animation and it'll render out those image files. All right, so let's go ahead and actually do that quite quickly. It drew out all the JPEG image files with my mouse in this window. I'll press escape on my keyboard. Let's go ahead and minimize Blender and check out that folder. Uh, it's right there. And if I open it up, you'll see a bunch of JPEG image files and they're all numbered. Great. I no longer in this video sequence editor want anything. So I'm gonna right click on this strip and press X on my keyboard and click on Erase Strips. Of course, you can press Delete or X to delete something in Blender. And I'm going to change this large window type into a Movie Clip Editor window. So down here, um, it's right above Video Sequence Editor, Movie Clip Editor. And this is where we have to do some tracking. And if you haven't done tracking before, it's a lot like making a mask. Um, if you have not watched my tutorial number three in this video series on uh, making a split screen effect, uh, I'll put a link to that on the screen right now. Uh, if you have not seen that one, we made a mask to put myself on the screen uh, twice. Um, let's go ahead and open that footage. I gotta click on open because I have not brought those images into Blender yet. And on my desktop, um, I'm gonna go into that folder. And you press A to select all in Blender. So I have to press A maybe a few times to make sure they're all selected. And I'll click on open clip. Notice how it recognizes a sequence of numbers, 001, 002, etc., as a clip when you have them all selected. 
and there we go. It's in there. If I scrub around uh, on my timeline, you can see the video plays. And again, we have our end set to 414, which is already the right length. So now we have to track. And as I was saying, tracking is a lot like making a mask. To make a new tracking point, you have to be in tracking mode down here. Um, this movie clip editor window has two modes, tracking uh, and masking, which we used in the last uh, video. But in tracking, you hold control and you click, but you're only making one point at a time. So I'm going to hold control. In fact, I'm going to do this marker up here. I'll hold control and click right in the middle. Uh, that's left clicking with control. And it makes a little tracking point, which is a standalone point. You're not making a line like with a mask of points. You're just making one point at a time. It's called a tracking marker. And I'll press S uh, on my keyboard and move my mouse out because I want to track the entire uh, marker. Now, because of the way that I'm uh, shooting or I've shot this video, uh, these tracking markers don't just move around. They don't move like flat on the screen, keeping their current orientation. They actually move in a perspective manner. That means that they might get smaller on one side when I'm putting the camera uh, on the other side of the laptop and I'm shooting it from a different angle. Uh, this square will kind of skew around uh, to make it look like it's you know, not looking at it directly straight on. So over here in the properties panel, if you can't see that, you can press N or this little plus on your keyboard. And under, I think it's tracking settings with this tracker selected, I'm gonna change the motion model um, under tracking settings again from location. We don't wanna just make this tracker uh, move around or tracking marker move around. We wanna change it to perspective. Um, let's go ahead and make a few tracking markers for the other points. We need at least four, but I'll do five. Um, just so you know, when it's tracking through the video, uh, especially if you very fast camera movement, you might want to look at, and I'll go to um, marker display, you might want to enable search. And what that will do is it'll show you the larger box around your tracking marker that shows you where it actually searches for the same image. Tracking is done basically by looking for this image um, in the next frame. So as you go, let's, we're on frame one right now, uh, to frame two, um, the tracking marker will move and it'll look for that original image of the position where you originally set the tracking marker um, in this area only. So if you have your search area too small and your video is moving too fast and this marker goes outside of this larger box, it will not find the tracking marker. So um, you might want to change the size of this search area, area depending on your uh, footage and how fast you're moving your camera. Let's go back to frame one and let's uh, hide the search area because we don't really need that for this video. And I'm going to hold control and click and then S to scale that out. And by the way, you want to make sure that the uh, center of your marker is where you want it to be up here under the track uh, heading. You can see that that little yellow crosshair uh, is right now basically in the middle of the plus and let's scale that down. Great. We'll do a few more. So I'll control click right there. Um, S and I might want to zoom in and get that perfect right about there. And let's go ahead and do this uh, big one. If you are making tracking markers for yourself on your own screen, um, then you might want to make sure that the tracking markers, if you're not using this image that I'm giving you uh, to download in the description area below, that you're putting them not at all the middle of the screen. If they're closer out to the wards of the corners, um, that'll get you a better result. So I'm gonna get a, quite a good result here, I believe. Okay, let's do, go ahead and do um, one more. I'm gonna do this one over here. Um, so I'm going to hold control and left click right there and S to scale that out. I have to, I have to make sure that all of these tracking markers have that perspective motion model. So I'll select them each uh, one at a time and convert them to perspective and not just location. And I think we're good to go. Let's go ahead and save this file. So file and save and I'll save this to my desktop and I'll just call this uh, corner pinning. 001, sure. Okay, we're about to start tracking, but what I'll do is I'll press A on my keyboard a few times, and I'm gonna change my tracking settings, not just for each marker, but the general tracker of Blender um, over here in the tool shelf, which you get by pressing T or this little plus, over to perspective as well. Under tracking settings, we don't want just 
uh, location we want perspective, which will also track location as well. I'm going to go ahead and prefetch uh, my video clip. That means it'll load into Bunder's memory uh, as many of those JPEG images as it can. So if I click that, um, you can see that this purple line just sort of propagated and filled out, uh, and that means that it's loaded in as many of the JPEGs as it can, depending on how much memory Blender is allowed to use on your computer. And let's go ahead and track uh, just one frame at a time for the first few frames, so I'll click on under track. Uh, this goes to the next frame, and because we're at frame one right now, um, it'll be tracking forward, so frame two, then frame three, then frame four. If you started putting your tracking markers, let's say in the middle, you uh, determined that our location at some frame other than one, you can track backwards um, all at once, or one frame at a time, or forwards all at once, or one frame at a time. So let's go ahead and press next frame. And I find that the first few frames that you do, especially if you have multiple tracking markers selected and you're tracking multiple markers, therefore, that it takes a few seconds. I cut off part of that video. Let's go ahead and press uh, next frame one more time. Okay, so it's all a little bit more movement there. You'll see a red line where it's tracking. And let's go ahead now and just press uh, play or track forward all at once. All right, so it's gone through all 414 frames. I sped that part of the video up uh, just so I wouldn't be boring you in this video. This did an amazing job of tracking. If I scrub through on my timeline, you'll see that um, it's showing the path from each frame to each frame where that marker is, and the boxes where the tracking markers are or their boxes are uh, distorting in a perspective manner uh, quite accurately. So it kind of looks like those boxes um, are on the screen themselves. Um, one of them did mess up. This small um, tracking marker, um, it can't quite follow the perspective correctly, so you'll see it kind of distorts in the wrong way. I'm not too concerned about that. Um, if you want to do a better job of tracking, I would use a shape that looks a lot more like these ones rather than circles because um, these you can tell how they're distorting more depending on how your camera is pointed at them. Um, if one of your tracking markers fails, which is very, very likely, I was very lucky here, and this yellow bar represents with your uh, tracker selected, um, how many frames it tracked successfully, um, you might have that yellow bar end at some point. So what you'll need to do, let's say um, I have a tracking marker and at frame 214, I'm actually just going to clear all of the tracking after that point with this button, and let's say you get to a frame and it just stops tracking and that means that it will be disabled, it won't be uh, counting as tracking at that point. You can actually just press G uh, to move that tracking marker around, with it selected of course, and you can put it back at the right spot, so up here I'm looking at where the little yellow crosshair is, and then you can try tracking again, and you can drag the little corners around, although that might be tricky with perspective. I'm going to try tracking one frame at a time. As you can see, it's doing it again. So you might just have to go ahead and correct um, and make keyframes, which is what that little bright yellow part is. It's the actual keyframe that I set. And so now I should be able to just track all the way through. And there we go. It did a pretty good job. I'm not too concerned. It's at this point that we're going to set up our plane tracking. And that's very, very easy. I'm going to press A a few times on my keyboard to get all of the markers selected. And then under uh, the Solve tab on the uh, tool shelf, there is a Plane Track section at the top. And I'm just going to click on Plane Track again with all the markers selected. And what it did was it put a rectangle around all of my tracking markers that I had selected. And it's this rectangle that will represent the mask of where the screen will show up and where the image will get corner pinned to. So what I can do is just left click and drag and put these points right at the corner of my rectangular screen. Um, if you don't have a rectangular screen, you might have to work with a uh, PNG or a TIFF image file that has transparency built in uh, to put something on a shape uh, that is not rectangular, uh, which might be a bit tricky. You might have to do your own like transparency with the image, in other words. Uh, that looks pretty good to me. Uh, I'm not going to be too picky here. There we go. That looks pretty good. So now if I scrub around, I'm actually at the last frame here, 414. But if I scrub around, you'll see that that rectangle is sticking uh, to my screen quite, quite accurately. Uh, if I had any problems with my tracking markers, if some of them didn't track properly and they sort of jumped around, uh, which can sometimes happen if you don't have a high contrast tracking uh, image that you're tracking, but in this case it's black and white and a funny shape, so it's uh, pretty good, then you might get inaccurate uh, corners and they might jump around. So you might want to go through all of your tracks and make sure that none of them are jumping around. 
um, on you. Okay, we have this rectangle. It's great. Let's go ahead and do a control S to save and I'll click to save uh, for real. And let's go ahead and use some nodes to do some compositing because we're going to composite using this data, um, the new image or movie onto my screen. So I'll grab this little cross hatch area up here and drag it straight down to split the window into two. And I'll change this upper window type into a node editor window for compositing, which means that as soon as it comes up, we're going to change the mode from materials to compositing nodes, and I'll click on use nodes and backdrop. And of course, it gives us a render layers node, which is our input from a source, in this case, a 3D scene, which we don't have. And we have a composite window, which outputs so we can actually render our result. I don't want this render layers node, so I'll click uh, to select it, and I'll press X to delete it uh, on my keyboard, of course and I'll press Shift A, we're going to input uh, a movie clip, so I'll add a movie clip node under input, and right here I'll just load in on this little film strip 001.jpg, which represents the entire um, strip or sequence of images. I'll connect the ports together so we have a, a complete path with an input and an output, and it's at this point that I'm going to bring in another node which is new, um, so let's go ahead and press Shift A, and I believe it's under Distort, and it's called Plane Track Deform, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's for uh, this plane tracking that we just did. So Shift A, Distort, and Plane Track Deform right there. Um, of course, when we're compositing one image over another, we have to use an alpha over node. So I'll press Shift A on my keyboard, and for some reason it's under Color, and it's called Alpha Over. And if you watched my last video um, on making a split screen effect, you'll know that we use this to layer two different shots uh, of myself, uh, one above the other, with a mask plugged into this factor. Uh, in this case, we're going to plug this plane drag to form into the second image, which will go um, below in this alpha over node, which means it'll show up above the video, so it's in the right order. And this plane tractor form has an image that we're going to plug in, which is going to be my snowman animation. So I'll press Shift A and input a movie clip. And I'm going to input, actually, I'm going to input, let's try a different node here. I'll delete that one, Shift A. I'm going to input an image node, uh, which actually does let you open a movie. So I'll click on Open and I'll find that snowman animation. You can just put a still image here if you want. Uh, mine's just an animation because that's what I chose. And this image node is actually much more powerful. I'm not sure why they still have a movie clip node. Uh, because you can actually tell this image node to be a movie and not just an image. Or you can even choose image sequence. Um, you can say how many frames it's going to be. And you can offset where your movie starts playing. So this is much more powerful, I think, than the um, movie clip node. We'll get into more how you can use this in a future video. Um, but I believe the frames in this snowman animation is 105, if I can recall correctly. And so now if I scrub through, um, you'll see that little animation playing, even though it's not connected up. I'm going to plug it into the image of my plane track to form. Um, so now, if I do a render, let's see what happens. Of course, if you want to pause the video and look at my nodes, you can. But let's go ahead and click render. And did it work? Uh, no, no, I forgot a couple of things here. I actually have to choose in the plane track to form, pardon me, um, what movie, in, in this case the video of my laptop, we're using um, that has a plane track associated with that movie file. So I'll click right here and I'll choose 001.jpg and because that sequence down here has a plane track to form associated with it, um, I gotta choose uh, the camera in my 3D scene for some reason. And then the next one is plane track, which is uh, this plane track that we did down here. Uh, this 3D camera is part of my 3D scene. Notice that how uh, if I switch back over to my 3D viewport, uh, there is a camera in my scene and for some reason I have to um, select that so I can't delete it from the scene. Uh, but let's just kind of keep moving and I think it should work. We've selected the camera, we've selected the plane track and the right footage. Let's go ahead and render it out just one frame. Aha, looks pretty darn good. Okay, we're going to make this even better. 
you could just leave it at that. You could go to any frame and you could click on render or you could render out uh, the animation and you get an okay result. What I'm going to do though is I'm going to layer uh, a few different things and I'm going to blur the edges of my video. I'm actually going to black out my screen first because it's a bright white screen and my video is not white so I want to kind of make sure that there's nothing on my screen in case the, tr the tracking isn't quite right. So I'm actually going to um, hold control and left click and drag and that gives me a knife that I can cut through um, a noodle. Of course I can drag a port away and it gets rid of the noodle too. And I'm just going to move this kind of over and off the side for a second because I'm going to put a black screen or a black image onto my laptop first using this alpha over and then after that's done I'm going to attach the snowman image or video or animation um, again after the screen is already black. So over here I'm actually going to reuse that plain tractor form. So with it selected I'll press Shift D on my keyboard. Shift D of course duplicates and I'm going to plug this copy which as you can see because there's no image plugged into it I can just choose a color and I'm going to plug that into uh, the alpha over and because I duplicated the plane tractor form, it has all the right footage. It knows that we're using this video, um, and it knows we're using the camera and the plane track. And so now if I press render, um, these nodes won't count because they're not plugged in, they're not part of the path, and it should render out the laptop with a black screen. I'm going to make this black screen a little bit bigger, and I'm going to blur the edges to get any sort of trace of that white glowingness of the screen uh, to make sure that goes away. So uh, right after plain track to form, I'll press Shift A. I'm going to add in a distort uh, scale node, and I'll add that in that noodle. So after um, this gets added, it will scale up the plane, which is actually like a mask. And I'm going to scale it up um, just a tiny little bit. In fact, 1.005 of its original size. So just like one or five one thousandths uh, bigger. Uh, but as you can see, if I actually make a backdrop for this uh, window, so I'll press Shift A, and I'll go to Output and Viewer. I forgot to do this earlier. Uh, this Viewer node, of course, just lets you basically put a background in this window of the current frame where you are, in this case, 204. Um, I'm going to add a new node here. It's a really small, in fact, it's as small as you can go, a node. It's called the Layout um, Reroute uh, node. So if I add that, it's just a little point and I can left click and drag to move it around but I'm going to put it right in the middle of that noodle and basically it acts as like a fork in the road so you don't have to connect up this alpha over uh, to the viewer itself and you can just uh, left click and drag that uh, new node which is just a reroute uh, into the viewer and so now we have a background and of course I can press V to zoom out Alt V to zoom in and I can hold Alt and orbit to uh, pan this around if I zoom in so Alt V you can see the edge here, and if I select that scale node and press uh, M, you can see that this goes out just a little tiny bit. So M with a node selected just mutes it, so it goes through it. Uh, if I hold Alt and pan up, it'll actually do it a little bit more on this top corner. So M, you can see it expands out a little bit just to cover more of the screen. And I'm going to blur the edge of that mask as well. So I'll press Shift A and I'll go to filter and blur and just put a Gaussian blur in there with two and two and as you can see it's a little bit blurry now and of course you can play with those values um, to your heart's content but it looks pretty good to me um, great let's go ahead now and add the uh, snowman animation on top so I'll press shift A I'll add another color alpha over node and because all of those nodes right there the original video the uh, plane tracker with just black and no image and then it's scaled and blurred and the alpha over those two are combined and now this noodle holds that finished video which you can see with a black screen on the laptop we're gonna then alpha over that video with the snowman video Okay, so now the snowman video is using that same plane tractor form uh, with the camera and the correct footage and the plane track uh, selected. And so now we've got our finished result. Um, if I zoom in though, again we have the problem where um, the edge of the video is very, very crisp. Even if I'm moving around on my camera and the video is blurred, the edge of the video will be very, very crisp. I don't want that. One thing I can do is I can click on motion blur 
um, on the plane tractor form and that will blur the video a little bit. But what I'm going to do here instead is use this output plane uh, port um, on this plane tractor form node and this actually gives us access if I just drag this up to here to our mask and so uh, a mask of course is a black and white image I'll reconnect this out because I don't want it to actually be that so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually plug that into the factor of this alpha over which gets that mask sort of automatically but if we plug it in um, manually this way I can add a blur uh, node under filter um, to that noodle just like that and now I can blur just the edge of that mask or the mask which defines the edge uh, and not the image itself so if I type something like 10 and 10 um, you can see that the edge gets uh, quite blurry uh, I don't want it that much so I'll just type maybe 3 and 3 or maybe even 2 uh, and two, just to kind of soften that edge out. And I have my finished result. So if I scrub through, uh, we'll see what the video looks like. Uh, just in that preview, it takes a few seconds maybe to load up and composite the different elements together, but I've got a pretty good result. Uh, the last thing I'll do is I'll export this to a MPEG-4 video. So under my camera tab in the properties window, um, I'm going to change JPEG to H.264 and under encoding I'll change AVI to MPEG-4 and I'll set my output location just to my desktop and I'll call this MacBook Air Corner Pin and I'll click accept and so now if I uh, render out the animation from 1 to 414 and I'll speed up the video we'll watch the video uh, that's the result. Alright, so let's finish rendering out. Let's go ahead and with our mouse in that window, I'll press escape on my keyboard to go back to our nodes. What I'll actually do is I'll make this full screen at the end of the video in case you want to take a look at my node setup uh, one more time. Alright, so let's go ahead and minimize this and let's take a look at the final result. Looks pretty darn good to me. I wouldn't necessarily know that anything is wrong with it. I might want to go back and play with some of the lighting and the uh, color adjustments, color grading on the video and maybe the entire movie itself, but I've got a pretty good corner pin and that's how you do it. Uh, at the end of this video, as promised, I'll put the nodes back up on my screen. I'll just press control up uh, on my keyboard and I'll select all my nodes and you can see them right there. All right, that'll be it for this video. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel to see more videos like this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.